In Michigan, the Johnson family is thrilled to move into an old family farmhouse. But they are not alone. I felt something touch me, and that's all it took. And they are not welcome. That was the moment that it decided my child was fair game. A mother will do everything to protect her family. It starts with one. This demon is out to destroy your entire family. And then attacks all. All I could think about was I just hope this works. This needs to work. In America, there is real evil. It lurks in the darkest shadows in our most ordinary towns. Between the worlds we see and the things we fear, there are doors. When they are opened, nightmares become reality. Betty Johnson and her two sons, Bryn and Dylan, are finally getting their wish. They are moving into a larger rural home located in the outskirts of Detroit, Michigan. For the past 20 years, Betty has been happily married to her husband, Bruce. And as a proud mother of two, she is determined to provide a better life for her family. The house belonged to my mother-in-law, and she got married and moved, so the house was sitting vacant. Oh, this is it. She wanted us to be able to have it, and we jumped at the opportunity. It's not perfect, but what do you think? I love it. Owning a house was an important goal to us. I wanted to be able to tinker around in my garage, you know, just kind of live the American dream. When I first moved out to the farmhouse and I took my first look at it, and it was a lot larger than most of the things that I have lived in, I realized that this is where I wanted to stay. Things seem okay for now, but are they? Let's go, boys. You got plenty of time for messing around later. Let's get this stuff off the truck. The first time that I walked in, it felt like home. And it was great. It was kind of quirky. It had its own kind of feel and charm to it. There were a lot of things that needed to be done cosmetically. Betty's first order of business is to organize the basement. But as she approaches the door, she gets an uneasy feeling. The basement in the farmhouse was kind of a creepy place. I never really liked it. Betty figures the house is just old. She needs time to get used to it. But it won't be long until her darkest fears become reality. The next week, Betty continues to unpack. She hears something in the basement. <laughs> something strange. I heard some sobbing. Hello? Someone there? I was confused because the children weren't home at the time. Are you hurt? It sounded as though she was in agony physically, that something was being done to her.
Betty wonders if one of her neighbors is hurt. I went outside and I couldn't hear it outside. I walked around the property looking for hurt animals that might be making those sounds. I never could find anything to explain it. Betty determines her imagination is getting the best of her. The atmosphere in the basement was creepy to begin with. I'd been working extremely long hours. I was so tired that my mind was just playing tricks on me. Over the next several months, Betty and her family finally settle in. Bruce continues to work long hours as an appliance repairman, while Betty juggles taking care of the kids and working at the mall. The boys were really enjoying their new home. Bryn was making a lot of friends in school and having a lot of fun, and Dylan really enjoyed playing with his brother outside in the yard. The Johnsons work hard at making the house their own, but still, something isn't right. I noticed a movement. When I turned to look, all I got was an impression of something dark running across the baseboards of the wall. I thought that I might be seeing our cat out of the corner of my eye. Ruggles, what was that? Did you get a mouse? But then, Betty sees the cat on the couch. Perhaps her eyes are playing tricks on her. Or maybe these visions are real. I saw a face staring back at me from the window. I knew that it wasn't a real person standing outside because the window was too high off the ground. I came to the conclusion that we might have a ghost in the house. Given how old the house is, it's not surprising that there would be a ghost or two hanging around. I've never been afraid of ghosts, so the idea made me more curious than frightened. But soon enough, her curiosity will turn to pure terror. A few nights later, Bryn is watching his younger brother while Betty and Bruce are at work. What was that? That, my friend, was an E flat to a D. No, not that. Shh. We heard a bang in our garage, and things fall in our garage a lot. It was a very cluttered, crazy place. But it, it sounded weird. It sounded like it was caused. Take this and follow me. Yeah, but I'm scared. Shh, just come on. Bryn and Dylan believe an intruder may have broken into the garage. Hey, Dad! Dad! Did you forget something? Terrified, Bryn realizes this man is not his father. All my hair stood up when I looked at him, and it just got so much colder. Suddenly, the man disappears. One moment he was there, and then he just wasn't there. It was like he just turned into air. I tried to tell myself, well, since it was dark in the garage and I could barely see in the first place, maybe there really wasn't anything there. I just tried to wrap my brain around it. I realized there was, there was no way I was just seeing that. It, it was really there. Mom, 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 stop, stop! Please, please stop! There's some guy in the garage! Have you seen him before? No, he's a total stranger! Mom, please come on! Oh, really not. Okay, okay, okay. Calm down. Calm down. Calm down! Betty is convinced that this is the ghost she saw in the kitchen window that morning. Children can be a little over-imaginative. But on the other hand, I'd been having so many strange experiences that I couldn't just discount what they were saying. For their safety, Betty asks the boys to stay by the car while she checks out the garage alone.
Mom, I'm telling you, we heard him. Dad, I told you to stay by the car. Why would some old geezer break in just to sort some washers? It's a ghost. That he can no longer hide the truth. An entity from another realm is in their presence. I explained to them that ghosts were real, but it wasn't something they should be frightened of. If something stirs up enough emotion, it's kind of imprinted into the world around you. So when people see ghosts, they're watching something that happened a long time ago, like an old movie. My mom told me that so that I would understand that there was no, no harm that could come to me. He's just there, like almost like a visitor. Bryn and Dylan are comforted by their mother's explanation. They realize they shouldn't fear something that cannot harm them. Or so they think. The next day, while the boys are exploring the property, Bryn notices something unusual. There's an older house in the back of our house that we use as a storage shed. And it's always been padlocked. It's strange. Grandpa would never leave this unlocked. It was weird because the door was unlocked and it's never unlocked because my grandpa was the only one who really had the key. Come on. Whoa. We're not supposed to be in here. Dude, you gotta check this out. Friend, this is where Grandpa keeps his tools. If we break anything, he'll kill us. Don't be a baby. Bryn? Uh-huh? I can see my breath. It's like 70 degrees out. Look. Our bodies felt completely normal, but something inside our lungs was cold. <sighs> so the first thing I thought was that there's definitely a spirit in here. Yeah, yeah, okay. Let's let's get out of here. Let's go. Let's go. Well, maybe it was the ghost. I felt like something was outside with me. Dude. Like it was taunting me. And I remembered what my mom told me. It's a ghost. Ghosts can't do anything. What is it, huh? What do you want from us? You know what I'm scared of you? I just kind of felt more empowered than the ghost was. That's why I engaged it. Why don't you just leave? Bryn's mother thinks ghosts are harmless. But what if she's wrong? And what if this one has found its latest victim? I didn't know how to rationalize it. I was just terrified. Provoking the paranormal presence, Bryn realizes the entity is much stronger than he ever expected. And when I spun around, I felt an energy run behind me, and it got really, really cold. Bryn, what were you doing in Grandpa's shed? Mom, listen, there's something there, and I'm pretty sure this thing's angry at me. Look, it just dropped this giant branch right on me, and I swear this thing just nearly killed me. Until this moment, Betty never believed that ghosts could interact with the living. Having a branch break or a locked door be opened made me reevaluate what I thought I knew about ghosts. And the first thing I thought of was what kind of effect it could have on my children. Betty worries that her sons are in danger and knows she must take control immediately. Later that night, Betty confides in Bruce. Are you happy? What kind of question is that? Of course I'm happy. Something happened today. What? You know how I've been telling you about all those strange things that have been going on around here? Yeah. It's happening to Bryn and Dylan too. What's happening? I just don't feel safe here anymore. There's something here. I don't want to risk the boys' safety. The violence seemed to be growing, and we didn't know how far it was going to go, and we didn't want to find out. We thought that as much as we loved the house, if things were becoming physical, 
that it would be better if we moved and took the boys away from that environment. And don't you want to have a place of our own? Just ours. We've probably saved up enough for a down payment. We could get a place closer to work. I was driving 45 minutes each way to work every day and gas was getting incredibly expensive. We decided that it was a good time to move. I suppose you're right. <laughs> Soon after, Betty and her family moved to a newer home in the nearby suburb of Novi, Michigan. We saved up enough money where we could put a down payment on a house that we could actually own and have it be ours. Not gonna need this anymore. It was very different. It was everything was new, everything was fresh, nice and clean. I mean, we really liked it, we were excited. It was a clean home, a clean slate. Everything seemed possible. But little do they know, their dreams will soon be shattered. <laughs> Just as life is improving for the Johnson family, things take an unexpected turn for the worse. Shortly after we moved into our new home, I lost my job, and it seemed as though the plan that we had that was coming together wasn't anymore. With Betty not working, it was up to me to take every bit of work I could get. I would do whatever I could to bring home more money. Hey, Brent, have you seen my pad? Uh, yeah, it's right there. But hey, you mind if I ride along today? This ain't gonna be no carnival, Brent. You're gonna get your hands dirty. How about you let me worry about that? Yeah, yeah, come on. Let's go. My dad worked a lot, but we still managed to stay close. Not a bad day for plumbing, huh? Yeah. <laughs> we did a lot of driving from house to house, so we always got time to talk. I had him ride with me to my service calls for about three or four months, and it was fun. I got to know him a little better. That's it. Good as new. All right. <laughs> Bryn appears to be the primary target of something supernatural. Bryn? Bryn? It's just water. No, that is blood. Bryn, there is no blood. Just water. See? See? Now the grease on your hands may look like blood. Bryn is terrified. To him, this is no mere hallucination. It felt viscous to my touch. It felt like, it felt more real like blood than it did like water. Bryn's visions of blood are horrifying enough, but worse is the feeling of alienation that accompanies them. I didn't know if my eyes weren't working right or just the connection to my brain was just getting confused. What is it? The lake. It's all blood. It got deeper red and started to look like blood. Come on, you know it can't be blood. But look at it, it's all blood. Maybe it's just a trick with the light. What did you hit? I didn't, I didn't hit anything. It's under the truck. Dad, stop the car, it's going under the truck. Oh, for crying out loud. Every time someone speaks, Bryn hears nothing but a scream. Someone or something is controlling his mind. But who or what is it? I couldn't even articulate what was going on. I thought I was going crazy. Bryn continues to see blood over the next several days. No matter what kind of liquid I was looking at, it looked like blood.
Bryn's increasingly strange behavior is starting to worry his mother. What's going on? On the, on the ride home, he uh, kind of, he, he freaked out. What? Says he saw blood in the lake and earlier when he was washing his hands. Wherever there's water, it's like he sees blood. My first reaction was the fear that maybe Bryn was doing drugs. He wasn't. My second fear was that something was wrong with him physically. To ease her fears, Betty takes Bryn to see a doctor. They ran an MRI, they ran an EKG, and the neurologist confirmed that there was nothing wrong with my brain and that there was no regular brain patterns or tumors or lesions. They didn't know what was causing it. Besides some obvious stress that I think Bryn's under, he's perfectly fine. I knew there was something wrong somewhere. Either I was crazy or there really was blood. And those were the only two options. I was trying to see it as a, a sort of message, like things are going to start getting bad soon. But instead of getting worse, after several days, the visions mysteriously go away. At last, Bryn is relieved he can finally take a shower and not be haunted by blood covering his body. And then I felt the uh, curtain move. As though like someone's fingertips were grazing across it. Dylan, cut it out. It got so cold. It, it was hot water and I still felt cold. And I couldn't shake the feeling that there was still someone in there. And I was looking right at it. I'm calling about your ad for the retail manager. Mom! Uh, is the position still open? Mom, please come quick! Yes, the one in today's paper. Mom, die now! Mom, it says to die now! I'm gonna have to call you back. What? Please, just come look. Bryn believes someone is trying to send him a message. Said Juan Eid like someone on the other side of the mirror wrote it forwards. Someone must have written it there before we moved in. Then why would I have not seen this before? Did you do this? What? Write on the mirror. No, why would I do that? I knew that Dylan would never do that to his brothers. He was terrified enough. Betty begins to feel helpless. She cannot explain the writing on the mirror and can no longer ease her son's fears. Something was happening to my son that I couldn't protect him from. That's when I began to get angry. I started worrying that maybe the doctors had missed something. Over the next few weeks, Bryn grows increasingly depressed and withdrawn. I spent a lot of time in my room because I didn't feel like being around people a lot, but I heard a voice as if it was coming from the room I was in. What? <laughs> There. When the voice speaks, it's with the same message Bryn had seen on the mirror. With powers of mind and now communication, the entity is growing in strength. It appears to be out to kill. Whenever I felt any split second of happiness, it would just rip it away from me and tell me I wasn't worth it. And now I should just end my life felt exactly like what had been happening in the farmhouse. I couldn't breathe, and I didn't know what to say to it. This thing really wanted to hurt either me or my family, and it was willing to travel 30 miles to do so.
After coming face to face with the dark figure, Rin realizes that he is not simply hallucinating. This entity is controlling his mind. Dylan? Did you see that? What? No, it was something black, like a shadow. Where's the cat? That was it! You just saw it, didn't you? Look, there it is again! It didn't look like the shadows that I had seen at the farmhouse. It was bigger. It didn't skitter away when I looked directly at it. As though it wanted me to notice it, wanted me to know that it was there. It was frightening. Bryn is relieved that his family finally believes him, but he realizes they are dealing with a force of pure evil. What the hell was that? It was my own personal monster, and it was just taunting me by taunting my family. There was a presence at that farmhouse. Betty believes that something from the old farmhouse must have followed them. They decide to call Bruce's mother for answers. Hi, Mom. Yeah, listen, uh, did anything strange ever happen at the farmhouse? Like, did somebody die? Bruce learns that a previous resident of the farmhouse was a violent man. Hey, old man. <laughs> Isn't it past your bedtime? <laughs> One night, the former resident interrupted a party on the property and became involved in a heated argument. That'll learn you, stupid old man. <laughs> The young man he struck did not die, but he was blinded in one eye. His girlfriend witnessed the incident. She ran straight to the police and offered to testify against him in court. But fate had its own tragic plan. The former resident died horribly in a car accident. Broke most of the bones in his body and spent the next 24 hours dying in terrible pain, from what we heard. Betty and Bruce are convinced that same man is now a ghost, bent on destroying their family. It felt really, really evil. Okay, now how do we get rid of it? I stopped looking for work. Every waking moment, I was on the computer trying to find somebody that could help me. Betty takes control and scours the internet, desperately seeking advice from paranormal investigators. But many investigators seem to be in it just for the money. I found a lot of con artists, and worse, they just immediately jumped and said, I can make all your problems disappear for X amount of dollars. The family decides to stick together until Betty can find some help. Bryn and Dylan sleep in the living room. Most of the activity happened in our rooms, and we were terrified to be in there at night. Oh, I'm sorry, honey. I didn't mean to scare you. Even though she cannot control the evil, Betty is trying to fix it. But with no money to spend on investigators, she is reaching a dead end. I was losing faith in the idea that it couldn't harm me, but my mom reassured me. And so since it was the only thing I had to go on, I believed it. Hey, Brand, if you're going to go take a shower, let me stand guard outside the door, OK? We should all keep together as much as we can. I felt something touch me. So I paused for just a second, and that's all it took. For more A Haunting, go to DestinationAmerica.com. An evil entity has invaded the Johnson home. Bent on destroying the eldest child, it has thrown Bryn down the hall. That's the most terrifying thing I've ever seen in my life. He had marks on his body where something had pushed him. It wasn't like a normal scratch. It felt like there was like a dirtiness to it almost, like if you get uninfected. 
but it, it was fresh. If it can do that, then what else can it do? Refusing to give up, Betty works tirelessly to find help. There had to be somebody out there that knew what was going on and knew how to deal with it. Brynn thought he was going crazy, but then I saw it too. We all did. No, you're not going crazy, but you have to be honest with me. Samantha Harris, an investigator with the Michigan Paranormal Research Association, is willing to help. She just sounded so confident, but at the same time I was thinking, yeah, well, you haven't heard what problems are going on in my house yet. I see on your website that you do a house cleansing. What exactly is that? We remove negative energy and spirits and replenish the house with a white light and positive energy. It's a purification ritual. I'm an ordained minister, and I'll lead you in a prayer. I'm not a very religious person. Do you believe in a higher power? Yes. Yes, I do believe in a higher power. I believe that performing a house blessing is kind of an obligation. Samantha seems genuinely caring and concerned. Betty is relieved that help is on the way. It sounded like it was a very severe case, and I wanted to respond to it as soon as possible. Later that evening, as Samantha is getting ready for the house blessing, she suddenly feels uneasy. It felt like something evil was in my house. I saw in the corner of my eye some movement. The dark figure she sees matches Betty's description of the entity that is menacing her home. I know what you are! I'm terrified inside, but I knew I had to assert myself and to stand my ground. We're gonna help that family, you hear me? You can't scare us off! In all the years that I had worked on demonic cases, I had never seen one physically appear for us. And it worried me. The next night, Samantha and her partner Kyle Gask Wilson arrive. You can just sense the heaviness, the depression, the anger, the hatred that was present. This is my family, my husband Bruce, my son Dylan. Dylan. And this is Bryn. Nice to meet you, Bryn. I'm Kyle. When I met Bryn for the first time, you could really tell that he had a lot of pain inside him. Fear that you could see in his eyes. The man who lived in the farmhouse before we did, do you think it's his spirit? I told Samantha about the man that had lived in the farmhouse before us, the one that had died in the automobile accident. Ghosts don't follow people around from one place to another. I believe that what we're dealing with here is a separate entity. A demon. Just hearing that word, a demon, made my skin crawl. Probably the same demon that influenced that man to act violently. I think it was very probable that the demonic entity attached itself to the previous homeowner of the farmhouse and then influenced his behavior. After the man died, the demon began searching for another, someone young and vulnerable. You, being under stress, were easy prey. I believe when a person challenges an entity that they become vulnerable. You know we're not scared of you? Why don't you just leave? And I think that challenge provoked it. That was the moment that it decided that my child was fair game. That would explain the visions of blood and the voices he hears. In my experience, human spirits typically don't have that type of power to physically lift people to claw at them. Those were some of the reasons why I thought this case was demonic. I was fearful it would soon move on to demonic possession. It's clear to me that this demon is out to destroy Bryn, and, and not just you, Bryn, but your entire family. Betty feels helpless. Her family is dealing with an entity of pure evil one with powers beyond her wildest imagination. All I could think about was I just hope this works. This needs to work. Did you see that? I think it was the demon trying to tell everyone in the room that no matter what we did, 
it wasn't going to leave. It's here. We thought we knew what we had been dealing with. We didn't. Now that the demon is present, Betty and her family know they must prepare for a battle with the supernatural. Having received a sign that the demon is present, Samantha prepares her assault on the entity. The power of their will, strong as it might be, would never be strong enough to defeat a demon. They must also use sacred oils, salts, and incense, materials known to drive out evil spirits. Olive oil is believed to be a symbol of peace, and it's believed to drive out negative energy as well. Smudging is a traditional purification rite that uses smoke to drive out evil. I like to use a Native American smudging method in combination with a Christian Catholic ritual, and we also use some South American rituals as well. White sage creates an atmosphere that's not hospitable for a demonic entity. Using a ceremonial feather, a gift from a Native American shaman, Samantha begins. As I walked into Bryn's room, I could really feel this heaviness. Kyle anoints the lintels with olive oil. Above each door and window, he makes a sign of the cross. As I was in Bryn's room, anointing above the window, a voice came to my right ear. Get out now. It shot shivers throughout my whole entire arm. I could feel the hair in the back of my neck just go straight up. As I turned around to anoint the other wall, I felt something grab my right arm. While Kyle anoints every portal, Samantha performs a ceremony in Dylan's room. Salt is believed to act as a barrier to keep a demonic feature from entering the home again. It spoke to me. What happened? In my right ear. It said, get out now, plain as day. Where were you? Bryn's room. This thing is really powerful. I don't know whether we should be here. This definitely stirred some fear inside of me, but we promised ourselves that we'll never stop doing a house blessing no matter what happens. I made a vow to protect this family. There! You could feel the entity move from room to room. It was like a cornered animal. You could feel the hatred it felt towards you, and it despised our efforts in trying to remove it. As the ultimate weapon in their battle against the demon, Samantha brings out a prayer. This is the warfare prayer. It's all that we have left. We must prove that we are stronger. What do you want me to do? Recite it, lead your family, believe in those words. The strength of your belief is all that matters now. Your mother is gonna read a prayer. I want you to repeat the words as she says them, okay? You have to do this right. To find the inner strength, all I had to do was look at my children. Heavenly Spirit, I claim the protection of the light. Heavenly Spirit, I claim the protection of the light. For my family, my finances, my home, my soul. The ability to defeat the demon rests on the power of prayer and the strength of Bryn to resist one final attack. For the Johnson family, gaining control of their lives has come down to one final prayer. My soul and my body. Halfway through the prayer, I noticed that Bryn started to act a little strange. My home, my soul, and my body. I take a stand against all the workings of darkness. I felt really sick every time I uttered a word. It felt like I was going to vomit. I take a stand against all the workings of the darkness. I could feel it struggling inside of me, almost like, like an animal in my chest. It was trying to take something with it. And if it succeeded, I wasn't going to be the same anymore. I resist the spirit of fear. I resist, I resist the, the spirit, spirit of fear. fear. Bryn. Bryn. Bryn, it's going to be OK. I've never seen this before in my life. 
I started to question, you know, are we going to be able to help this family? Brynn, it's going to be okay. Brynn, I'm here. Go on. I can't. Go on. Finish. I can't. Finish it. Ultimately, a demon wants to destroy life, wants to destroy hope. That's what this demon was trying to do, was trying to destroy my family. No! You can't take him! You have no power here! Nothing will hurt me! Nothing will hurt me! I'm gonna stand up to it like I did that one day. Because wanting to terrorize me is one thing, but wanting to destroy me, is that's unacceptable. I claim complete just gone. I felt like I could breathe normally for once. There wasn't something holding me down. It felt like there was this light that came into the home. It's actually such a beautiful moment. It was very touching to have helped Betty's family. Can I give you a hug? The gratitude felt by Betty and her family runs so deep they cannot possibly express it. At last, they are safe. You've been through hell and back with the family, and so when you change their lives, it's a fantastic feeling. If we hadn't have found Samantha and her team, I would have lost my family. I don't think that even the strongest family could survive something like that for too long. We were always a family. We were always there for each other. And the love that we have for each other got us through. As the days passed, there was a lightness in the house. Here we go, guys. We felt more energetic, younger, happier. Our house felt nicer and felt like I could take deep breaths and feel comfortable. I stopped hearing those evil voices. I stopped feeling sick. I feel like we are finally back to just being a family. Just the wind, guys. The window's open. Before this happened, if anyone had asked me if I believed in demons, I would have had to say, uh. But now I'm thoroughly convinced they had to have been a demon. It's kind of like a tick or a parasite. The longer you let a demonic entity reside in your life and in your home, the harder it is to get rid of it. Because of this whole experience, we know that we can rely on each other. What I want for my family now is the same thing that I've always wanted for my family. I want my children to be happy, to be successful human beings. I want us to always love each other. My dream for my family has never changed. But now I think it has a chance of becoming reality. battle between angels and demons. If you ask me, I'm face to face with Satan. We're this close. Not within the realms of heaven and hell, but within one woman's mind, body, and soul. I almost thought in my mind that, oh my God, maybe it's a possession. In America, there is real evil. It lurks in the darkest shadows in our most ordinary towns. Between the worlds we see and the things we fear, there are doors. When they are opened, nightmares become reality. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle by the power of God. Send you to hell, Satan, and all evil spirits who wander this world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. Arnold, Maryland, just outside of Annapolis, 
is home to Kathy Sheets. In the fall of 2010, Kathy and her son Michael are at a crossroads, preparing to start a new chapter in their lives. My son and I have a very special bond. Um, we have been through so much together. I'm stopping. I have been raising Michael pretty much on my own since Michael was a baby. A typical life of any single mother where you're juggling 50 different things at a time, but you try and spend as much time with your child as you can. After years of living alone with her son, Kathy has invited her boyfriend, Brian Davis, to come live with them. For professional reasons, Brian consented to be interviewed only under the condition of anonymity. When I met Kathy, it was pretty much love at first sight. It was uh, just that feeling of, you know, you just met somebody you've been looking for for a long time. <laughs> Get all this stuff in. Just stand there, Michael. Grab a box. Hey, buddy. Please. Brian is about to finalize his divorce and is nervous about starting a new relationship. Sure about this? I'm sure. Well, welcome home, honey. Thanks. <laughs> I'm here. You know, 43 years, I'm here. I have met my soulmate. This is the man I'm going to grow old with. Ryan lived in, and Mom was absolutely thrilled. My townhouse was my safe zone. My home is a home that everybody comes to. <laughs> everybody eats there. Everyone, when you have a problem, they land at Kathy's house. To help Michael get comfortable with the new living arrangements, time, right? Brian moves into a spare bedroom in the basement. At first glance, everything seems normal. As I'm unpacking my stuff moving in, I could literally hear something walking behind me. It's, uh, you could hear footsteps in sequence. I could take my head and follow the sound around me. You know, I'll just pass it off as the house the ventilation system kicked on or floors acclimating, you know, whatever it was, I didn't pay much attention to it. Brian doesn't mention this strange occurrence to Kathy. What he doesn't know is that this is only the beginning of a terrifying series of supernatural events that will change their lives forever. And Michael will be targeted as well. While Brian spends one last night in his old house, Michael works in his room. He thinks the only other living being in the house is his mother. I was in my room, I was awake on my laptop, and so I felt like someone just crawled up my back like a spider. Mom. Michael. Were you in my room a few minutes ago? No. No, go to bed. Children at that age, you don't know what they're thinking. If it's a bug, kill it. You know, if I have to get up to kill a bug, you know, I'm going to be upset. It's 3 o'clock in the morning. I took it as Michael just finding an excuse to stay up late. Go, Michael. I have work tomorrow and you have school. Seriously, go to bed. Brush it off. You're a man. Deal with it. Say Hail Mary and you'll be fine. Go to bed. <laughs> All right. Even though my mom told me that nothing was there and to go to sleep, don't worry about it. 
I always had the fear in the back of my mind that someone was there watching me. Whatever touched Michael in his room is now ready for Kathy. I woke up in the middle of the night to my entire bed shaking. It almost felt like an earthquake. I looked outside first, and then I looked around the room to see if something had fallen, and I didn't see anything. I was able to write this off as, I have no idea what it was, but it's not a big deal. Kathy wonders if her fears may be based on her new commitment to Brian. So she decides to consult Bonnie Morris, a family friend who is a psychic. Are you? you ready? Mm-hmm. Okay. What I'd like you to do is take a moment and think about what you'd really like to know, what you'd really like to ask. Is this thing going to work? I don't always tell people what they want to hear. I tell them what I'm actually seeing. A lot of times people don't want something to work because they're vulnerable. Bonnie uses tarot cards, ancient tools of the occult, to influence her advice. Some cards represent fallen angels who become demons. What may appear a random sequence convinces Bonnie their fears are justified. If you can overcome your fears, you can have a very bright future together. I did tell her that the relationship had a good potential, but there was no guarantee. In the following weeks, Kathy's fears about the future begin to fade. I could see the bond between Michael and Brian developing. And it was a nice feeling to finally have a father for Michael on a daily basis. But just when Kathy begins to feel her life is coming together, a drastic change occurs in the same room where Brian heard mysterious footsteps a month earlier. I had gone into the basement and I went to turn on the light and it wouldn't go on. Standing before Kathy is a figure that will become her worst nightmare. Kathy Sheets is experiencing her first encounter with the face of evil. That is the most intense, incredible fear of your entire existence in that moment. Horrific is a light word. I need to talk to you. Yeah. This is serious. What happened? I saw something in the basement. I think it was a man. I mean, he was there, then he was hey, gone. Wait, 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 I don't know wait, what wait, I saw, but I know I saw down. something. Slow down. And I could tell, you know, in her eyes that she was very scared and, and didn't know what was going on. I was in our room. I wanted to believe her. At first, I had said that, well, maybe you're just tired. Uh, was it a dream? Uh, me being skeptical, of course, trying to find a logical reason for it. And she told me flat out, no, I saw something with my own eyes. I was wide awake. You believe me? Yeah. Yeah, of course I do. It's just, you know, whatever it was is gone now, right? Maybe you're just tired, OK? And then he, of course, calm down. <laughs> calm down. It's OK, Kathy. It's OK. You know what? You need to take it easy for a while. Right. We'll find out what it is. Brian knows this is similar to what he experienced, but for now he keeps that to himself. Kathy has no idea that the dark force that she encountered may soon be battling for her soul with a very different entity. I noticed that at the corner of my eye something very fast and white and there he was this enormous white beautiful angel 
I had never seen a wingspan that large before. I had never seen anything like that in my life. I thought I was dead. It lasted about five seconds, very clear. I didn't know who it was, but I knew that this was something pretty amazing. I thought if I'm not dead, I'm dying because you're not supposed to see these things unless it's upon your death. Kathy is desperate for some kind of explanation, so she immediately goes to her friend Bonnie, hoping that the psychic can help her understand what she saw. I see an angel, I see demons. What's going on? This, this thing was right in front of me. As close as we are right now, but I know it sounds crazy, but it's true. I, I just don't know what I saw. It, okay, that, okay, let's take a moment, take a deep breath. I believe that what you saw is your spirit guide. You mean an angel? Mm -hmm. If you'd want to call it that. Why would I see something like that? If it was your spirit guide, it's trying to help you. Okay. Or, or warn you. I gotta go to work, no, buddy. No, no, if I start thinking like this, I'll go crazy. I think if I just don't pay any attention to it, it'll, it'll go away. I'm just gonna keep praying, I'm gonna go to work, I'm just gonna live my life and just pay no mind to this at all, and it'll go away. Kathy tries to forget her visions, instead focusing on her future with Brian. In June 2011, Brian's divorce is finalized. He and Kathy immediately decide to get married. Honey, are you ready? I am. Wow, you look beautiful. Thank you. I am. Let's do this. I felt by making the relationship into a formal marriage would relax everybody's mind. In his mind, from his past marriage, in my mind of being a single mother for a long time, in Michael having a stepfather finally that he could turn to for everything. For me, it, it was, it, it felt good. It was gonna work. After the wedding, Kathy works hard to maintain a romantic atmosphere. While Michael is away at a friend's house, she prepares for a night alone with Brian. Michael's at a friend's house tonight. It's just the two of us. We better hurry up then. <laughs> See you soon. And all of a sudden, my hand went numb. I looked down and they were blue. Normal thinking is you're having a stroke, but it's both hands. A stroke is normally one side of the brain or the other. I didn't know what it was. And I got on the phone and I called 911 and I said, something is wrong, I'm turning blue. Then the back of my head went numb. I need an ambulance. I can't feel my hands. I think I'm gonna pass out. For Kathy, what she thought was only psychological is now becoming physical. Kathy, she's... And the stakes will be high for herself, her family, and her sanity. When Kathy Sheets is rushed to the hospital, she is found to have blood pressure of 200 over 100. Normal is 120 over 80. Mr. Davis, ma'am.
We can't exactly say what brought the attack on, but she's stable for now, okay? You can take her home in the morning, but the most important thing to remember is that she's gonna need to get plenty of rest over the next few days. Okay. All right. Thanks, doctor. You're welcome. The doctors hadn't come to a conclusion as to why her blood pressure would jump up like that. Uh, but what the doctors did say is that under normal circumstances, somebody would have gone into a cardiac arrest or had a stroke. The doctor at the hospital at that time told me it was a panic attack. There was nothing wrong with me. They called it situational stress, meaning that somebody can be under so much pressure and so much stress that it will elevate the blood pressure to the point of almost a stroke and or combustion. And once you alleviate that stress, it will then go away. In the morning, Kathy returns home, relieved that she doesn't have a life-threatening medical condition. Mom. Hi, sweetheart. Come here. Are you OK? Mm, I'm fine. I just need to take things a little slower from now on. Think you can help me with that? She said, honey, something's going on with, with me, and I can't be the same mom I used to be anymore. I have to worry about myself now. I said, OK. I was kind of sad that mom wouldn't be the same anymore for, like, ever. I, I kind of got used to it. One morning, while Michael is at school, Kathy speaks to an old friend. She is desperate for support. Oh, the doctor said it was stress, but that doesn't explain everything. No, oh, Brian doesn't know what to do either. Nobody does. I feel like I'm completely alone. I need help. I, I can't do this alone. Oh, great. Boy, I thought my life was bad before. This is as bad as it gets. Why didn't I just see that? So you don't know what to do. I was really scared. Soon after the latest attack, Kathy goes to pick up her son from school. She is exhausted and hopes the worst is over. It's not. And I'm sitting in that car. Something's pressing on your head and you can't see it. And you can't speak. And it takes your head and it twists it in a very unnatural position. Like it's gonna take your neck and snap it. Your head twists that way. And you feel something right here and you can't get your words out. It is the most screwed up feeling I've ever had in my life. Something is trying to kill you. I started to say the Our Father, and I couldn't get the Our Father out. I was walking out of school, from summer school, and she was in a weird position. Mom? Mom! It looked very unnatural, very unnatural. To the point where I was like, it was, I knew it was forced upon her. I said, hold mommy's hand. What is that prayer that mommy taught you? He goes, our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Say it again, say it again, say it again. Jesus, God in heaven, what just happened to me? I was worried about what's going on with her, and she wouldn't tell me. Michael, something's trying to hurt me, baby. I can't see it, but it's there. No. 
To Kathy's horror, she learns that her son has been experiencing supernatural events as well. I was in my bed. I, I was just listening to music. And the pull, pull to my backpack, or pull it all the way back. You see it stretching. It literally flew across the room. And it landed on the floor right next to you. When Michael finally came forth with some of the things that had happened to him, I was upset. I felt like I was a bad mother. I'm so sorry. I let something get near my son. He couldn't come to me. It's okay, Mom. I did not defend my son. That's not a good feeling. I don't know, Kathy. Maybe this thing is in your head. All in my head? Nice. It's happening to Michael, too. You can't keep ignoring this. I am not ignoring it. But I can't believe something just because you want me to. We don't have to try so hard not to believe it. My son's safety is at stake here. He's scared, OK? I believe that. But that does not mean there are ghosts in the house. Kathy's personality turned 180, 180 degrees. She was very desperate to have anyone and everyone believe her uh, because she was scared. Whatever was going on, you're there for your spouse, for better, for worse, richer and poorer, sickness and in health. That was not happening. And I felt it. Oh, Kathy, I am so tired of hearing about this all the time. I don't know what is going on, and I can't do anything about it. I just want everything to go back to normal. So do I. I just don't have that option. I felt like I had completely lost the, the, the woman that I married. Um, and it, it was very, uh, very confusing for me. That same night, the family is so troubled by their experiences, they sleep in the same room. And Michael becomes the demon's target. is that Michael is repeating the argument she had with Brian. How could this child who was not even home know what I said to Brian before I went to work? He wasn't even there. Brian realizes things are far from normal, but he cannot comprehend how his family could become cursed. Honestly, the reason I had thought that that situation occurred to where Michael sat up and spoke. I almost thought in my mind that, oh my God, maybe it's a uh, possession. For more A Haunting, go to DestinationAmerica.com. In the spring of 2011, Kathy Sheets witnesses supernatural behavior in her 15-year-old son, Michael. She seeks help from her husband. Michael? The next morning, I told Brian I did not tell my son. I was afraid to tell my son. Oh, hey, by the way, something spoke through you. You don't tell your son that. He repeated our entire conversation from yesterday. Every word verbatim. How could he do that? He wasn't even home yesterday when we were talking. So I started to research. What do you do when you got a demon in your home? Google. Kathy finds and invites Hiram Henderson to the house, a former naval intelligence officer who performs paranormal investigations. What appealed to me about Hiram is he's smart. I don't know anything about technology. I don't know anything about paranormal. I don't know anything about any of this. He does. After seeing his credentials and, you know, seeing the stuff that he showed us, we felt reassured that, you know, this wasn't a uh, kind of a fly-by-night thing. He was, he was the real deal. I needed to have an explanation for what was going on. And I felt that he would be the guy that could provide that for me. 
Hiram sets up devices to capture EVPs, electronic voice phenomena, using a spirit box set to record random radio frequencies. The general den of questions tried to flesh out what entities might, inf might actually be there that could confirm our experience. Why are you here? What do you want? Are you of God? I think you're afraid of me. You're not welcome in this home. You have to leave. At Hiram's office, Kathy and Brian hear the sounds of their demons. Why are you here? I'm not into hearing this stuff. I don't want to hear it. I see it, that's enough. What do you want? Although the message is incomprehensible, the very fact that the demon is communicating with the earthly realm is terrifying. Oh boy, there's something in my home. There's not just one. There are many. I think you're afraid of me. Oh God. The content of what Hiram found on those EVPs was horrific. All these horrific things that confirmed, 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 confirmed exactly what I had seen and heard. You're not welcome in this home. You have to leave. God, I am so sorry I didn't believe you. Thank you. I understand that sometimes there are some things that you think you might hear and you don't, but what I heard uh, was real. Wow. Finally, he understands. It was a relief. OK, help me fight. Thank God, thank you. And we're not done yet. If you guys want to get rid of this thing, you're going to have to do it yourselves. Hiram said to me in a conversation that this is the mother of all portals. He has never heard or has been in contact with anything this great. Every second, every inch, every minute of every tape is covered with multiple entities. It is a mystery to Hiram why Kathy's home might be such a passageway. He offers no solutions. He's a scientist, not a soothsayer. Paranormal investigators consider portals to be doorways through which spirits pass between earthly and unearthly dimensions. It is a mystery to Hiram why Kathy's home might be the location for such a passageway. After learning the horrifying news that their house is a portal, Kathy and her family try to get a good night's sleep. fire alarm sends Kathy Sheets and her family into panic. But they quickly realize it was a false alarm. I went and checked the battery in it. The battery's fine. It's an electric one with a battery backup. Went off for no reason. Michael. It's OK, sweetie. It's just a false alarm. But deep down, Kathy knows this is yet another sign of a demonic presence. She decides it's time to seek help beyond psychics and paranormal investigators. Kathy needs to fight pure evil with pure good. I knew I needed help. I needed something higher than me. Thank you for seeing me, Father. 
What can I do for you? I'm seeing things in my house. I've seen a white apparition, and I've seen a dark apparition. And I'm really, really afraid for my family, Father. There are angels and demons all around us. They're always with us, but God is with us too. And anytime you need help, all you have to do is ask Him. Remember, He is bigger than any evil in this world. After hearing Kathy's story, the priest concludes he has no choice but to encounter the demon himself face to face. For Kathy Sheets, months of nightmarish experiences convince her and her family to call in a priest. When the priest arrived at our house, you know, this was like our salvation. We couldn't get him in the house fast enough. You know, we felt like this was what we needed. This was the answer. Um, this would take care of all of our problems. He could feel some bad energy in the house, especially down in the basement where our bedroom was. That was the strongest energy down there. In a matter of seconds, Father John knows something is here, something very dark, something that wants Kathy gone. Oh, Heavenly Father, Almighty God. The priest sensed a, a negativity. He sensed a thickness. He sensed a, an anger, something. I don't know what you call it. He sensed it. You could feel it. He was scared. His hands were shaking. And may the angels of thy light dwelling within this house protect all in this house through the persecution of the devil. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We'll be safe now. He told us, after everything's been blessed, you say your prayers, and everything will be fun. Lord, we beg you to visit the house and to banish from it all the deadly powers of the enemy. May your holy angels dwell here to keep us in peace, and may your blessings be upon us always. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. That night, when the family goes to bed, they hope their prayers will be answered. I woke up from a horrible dream, a horrific dream enough to make you wake up in sweats. But this is no dream. Directly on the other side of the bed, there's this thing. He was three feet from me looking straight in the face at me. Boy, what a way to wake up. Holy mother of God! I grab the crucifix, grab the holy water, say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, Jesus Christ! No. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He leadeth me beside the still waters. Get out of my house! He restoreth my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And I threw holy water all over my house. And I'm standing in circles with the crucifix going like this. Yeah, though I shall walk in the shadow of the valley of death. I oh, fear no evil, What's for wrong? thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff comfort me. Kathy. Surely goodness and mercy will be with me all the days of my life. Mom was throwing it like, holy water. Holy water to throw it all over the room. Kathy, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I felt the presence of something there. I couldn't see or hear it. There was definitely something going on, and it was unexplainable on a human level. That's not my mom. That's not the real mom that she always was. I waited up all night. I did not close my eyes. 
And as soon as that sun came up, I got on the phone with that priest. Hi, Father. It's Kathy. Father, it's, it's still here. I woke up this morning and I could hear it chanting. Then I saw it right next to me, face to face. I told him what happened. He said, get out of the house immediately. The concern that he had was a possession. So did I. It felt great leaving the house. It got to a point where none of us really even wanted to be in the house. Michael said, Mommy, you're scaring me. You're scaring me. I said, shut your mouth. Don't say a word in the car. Don't talk. Don't anybody talk. Don't tell anybody where we're going. Say nothing. Get in the car. Nobody said a word. After Kathy and her family spend the night in a hotel, Kathy determines there is only one last way to rid the demon from her home. She must do it herself. It was hard to go back into the house. Out of the three of us, I think I was probably the least scared. Um, but it was still, I was still a little on edge, you know, about, you know, falling asleep at night, not knowing what's going to be over me if I wake up or, you know, what's going to happen. What am I? <laughs> Joan of Arc? No. I'm just Kathy. I am not a priest. I'm not a nun. I don't know how to do an exorcism. I don't fight demons. I'm just a regular girl that works. I had to keep myself calm. I had to feel love. No fighting. I gotta pray, I gotta focus, and I gotta close this thing. The time has come for Kathy to become a heroine or a victim as she battles the dark force trying to destroy her in the ultimate battle between good and evil. For Kathy Sheets, control of her home and her soul has come down to one final battle. I felt so alone and so scared, but I couldn't give up. The only way to close a portal is with your emotions. You have to be strong. You have to feel the full power of the Lord to get it out. They want you mad, they want you upset, they want you crying, they want you to be fearful. You do the opposite. Have no fear. No fear. We now claim that the strong man shall be bound through the precious blood and in the name and authority of Jesus Christ. It was my last flare left in a sinking ship. Help. It was all I got. I'm at the end of my rope. I command you to leave this house. This is the house of God. Oh, I was yelling in the name of Jesus Christ. I command you to leave my home. I command you. This is a house of God. Nothing else. Of God. And there's nothing more powerful than God. That's good. Keep praying. I'll keep praying. You're doing good. You're doing good. Come on. Give us this day our daily bread. Get out of my home. This is my home. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. You put your hand up in mercy, and you're calling upon the strongest angel in heaven. He's a warrior. St. Michael, the archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and the snares of the devil. May God rebuke him. We most humbly pray, do thou. O oh, Prince of the Most Heavenly Host, by the power of God, send into hell Satan and all evil spirits who wander this world, seeking the ruin of souls. God, help me. Saint Michael, help me. Amen. He grabs your arm. You can feel the fingers but not too strong enough to hurt me, but strong enough to let me know I'm there. But the good news is, is that my side came in because my prayers did work. And those floodlights went on and you can hear, save her, 
Somebody help her. Somebody help this woman on this realm. I thank God every single day for that second visit. God, thank you, has saved my life. Kathy believes that she was literally touched by an angel. She feels confident that the worst is over. After this had happened, uh, I saw a drastic change. It was almost a night and day difference. When I saw this happen to mom, I felt like it was a very small miracle. A lot of stuff has been gone and the cast is way out of the house. A lot of people are victims of fear and they don't do anything. They don't know how to fight it. Kathy's learning how to be a fighter. She's not allowing certain situations in the material world or other worlds to intimidate her anymore. That was what the whole lesson was about. That's the truth, not to be afraid. I don't see the dark spirits. I don't feel them there. It is as if the, the weight of the house is off. It's, it's, like a, um, it's like being smothered, and now you're not. You can breathe. You can breathe. You can rest. You can sleep. I think I'll always sleep with my rosary and my crucifix in my Bible, in my holy water. I carry them with me everywhere I go. That will take a long time to put those down, but I should be praying anyway. But I feel confident now, knowing that they're there for me. I'm never alone. After this happened, I know I'm never alone. I'll never be alone, ever again. A man devotes his life to defeating a demon. I started doing everything that I could to get this thing out of the house. But when old memories are awakened, new terrors come to life. I always had the feeling that whenever it was there, it was gonna hurt me. What happens when childhood scars turn into living nightmares? In America, there is real evil. It lurks in the darkest shadows in our most ordinary towns. Between the worlds we see and the things we fear, there are doors. When they are opened, nightmares become reality. What's behind this door? The cellar. You need to go down there. We drive you from us, whoever you may be. No, Bishop, wait! Bridgeport, Connecticut, 1962. Bring around the rosy, pocket full of posies. Ashes, ashes, we all fall down. <laughs> Dorothy Baker and her family are living in a house built for them by her uncle and father. Oh, you guys are my babies, you know that? I love you so much. Oh, oh, oh come on. Come on. Oh. <laughs> I'm not a baby anymore. Oh, I know you're not. I just love you so much, Bobby. Guys, help me with the laundry, Robin. Will you grab the basket? <laughs> Thanks. For Dorothy and her husband, Francis, owning a house is a dream come true. My mom and dad gifted me with the land. Then after that, my parents built their house right next door, which made it very convenient and very nice. Oh, hi, Bobby. <laughs> <laughs> Bobby. Dorothy is a homemaker, and Francis is an ex-Marine. He makes a living working for an aircraft manufacturer in Stamford, Connecticut. Mom? Yes? Can we go over to Grandma and Grandpa's? With a house in the suburbs, two healthy children, and a loving husband, Dorothy has everything she's ever wanted. I was just thrilled to pieces to have my own home and have a yard and be able to plant flowers and have a place for the kids to play. That's what I was looking forward to. Bobby and his sister Robin are very close. Our family was very tight-knit early on in the early years. We were just like your typical family that you would find in any street USA. Bobby! 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 
Bobby! Bobby, I told you to wait up! Come on, Robin, stop being such a girl. Bobby and Robin spend most of their days entertaining themselves. And this afternoon seems like any other. Hey, Robin. Who's that man over there? What are you talking about? Man next to the tree? I thought it was a real man at first. There's nobody there. But then I realized that I was the only one who saw him. Bobby can't explain it, but the image of the man terrifies him. He didn't threaten us or say anything to us, but I just knew that there was something bad about him. Run! Bobby! Faster! Run! Mom! Mom! Wait, I thought you guys were headed to Grandma and Grandpa's house. What happened? Bobby chickened out. Did not. Did too. You were afraid of some invisible man. That was very frustrating because I was thinking that they should be able to see him, and I didn't understand why they couldn't. Okay, enough with the invisible man, you two. Let's go wash up and get ready for supper. My thoughts were at first, he's just little, he's playing and just making believe. It was just a strange thing to me because it was out of character for him. Later, that same afternoon. <laughs> Surrender! I surrender! I surrender! Die, die, die! No! Don't kill me! Bobby. Bobby. When I heard the voice coming from the vent, I was curious, but I was also afraid at the same time. Play with me. Where are you? And I started talking back to it, because at that age, you don't realize you shouldn't be talking to something called talking to you from a heater vent. Why are you? Where are you? Down here. I automatically assumed that that was coming from the basement. How did you get down there? I live here. You do? Want to be my friend? Sure. Bobby, who are you just talking to? My friend. I felt uneasy about it, but I thought it was a kid thing. To Dorothy, her son's behavior is understandable. She believes her son has an overactive imagination. OK, sweetie. Well, why don't you um, tell your friend that you'll be back in just a little bit. Grandma's on her way over. Come on. I thought he was just a little boy fooling around playing games. I thought it was kind of cute. That day. Dorothy's mother arrives to give her a hand with the children. Honey, I'm here. My father worked all the time, so he was never home. My mother and my grandmother pretty much took care of us. Francis has recently taken another part-time job to support his family, leaving Dorothy with the extra responsibility at home. She's happy her mother lives nearby. My grandmother was like a second mom to us. She was there for us all the time. Tell us a story, Grandma. All right. Come, children, gather round. Can I grab you a cup of coffee, Mom? Thank you. Oh, thank you, dear. Did your grandfather ever tell you the story about this very house? Well, a very long time ago, before you were even born, your grandfather purchased this land. When it came time to build the house, he hired a few contractors to come dig up the property. One of the contractors noticed something unusual. What was it? Human bones. They decided that they were going to not call the authorities because it would just tie up construction at the, the property, the house. And they wouldn't be able to pour the foundation because it'd be an investigation. So they left the bones where they were intact and poured uh, the foundation over top. They figured the person was dead, so there wasn't anything that could be done about it. So they just left it as it was and put the foundation on and then built the house. You got to understand, winter was coming on. And they had to lay the foundation before the ground froze. Really, Grandma? Was the skull there, too? 
I'm not sure, honey. You'll have to ask your grandfather about that. Mom, that story's an old legend. <laughs> You're gonna give him nightmares. It's okay, okay Robin. Okay, no more scary stories from Grandma. All right, I've got one point, but now on your turn, okay? Over the next several months, Bobby continues to interact with his imaginary friend. I got acclimated to hearing him talk and, you know, watching him play, and I didn't think too much of it. And they'll just keep on spinning for a really long time, and <laughs> they just won't stop. Baker residence. Hello? Hello? Bobby? <laughs> Are you playing hide and seek? Bobby? Bobby? Honey, what on earth are you doing down here? Hiding. What are you hiding from? My friend. Bobby no longer enjoys his friend's company. But why? Could there be a link between this friend and the man in the yard? He was afraid of his friend. His friend had suddenly turned from someone that was playful and now it seemed like he was being scared by this, and it frightened me. I always had the feeling that whenever it was there, it was gonna hurt me. I just always felt that it was trying to push me towards doing bad things. But Bobby cannot hide from the horrific thing that are about to happen. Young Bobby Baker is experiencing the first in what will be an endless series of terrifying nightmares. When the sheet came down on top of me, it was so tight that it would cut off my breath, and I couldn't move at all. Okay, son, we're here now. You'll be fine. Honey, this is okay. It's okay, son, we're here now. We tried to reassure him that it was only a bad dream, and all people have bad dreams now and then. But was this really just a dream? I couldn't really figure out what was going on with him. It bothered me because he was changing. The following morning, Dorothy calls in a doctor. She suspects there may be a medical cause for Bobby's problems. So your mom tells me you're having trouble sleeping. Well, now let's just check a few things here. Now this is gonna be just a little bit cold. My parents were bringing me to the doctor because I didn't have any energy. I was constantly drained all the time. I wasn't sleeping properly, always tired. Well, his vital signs are just fine, and so are his reflexes. Well, see, the thing is, is he's been having nightmares. And to be honest, I'm just really concerned about this um, imaginary friend of his. He's not my friend. Now, Mrs. Baker, there's no need to worry. There's, there's nothing psychologically wrong with that. And said he was fine. He was physically fine, mentally fine, alert, everything that she was looking for. 
He simply has an overactive imagination. That's all. <sighs> okay, thank you. I was not personally relieved with her diagnosis because I never felt that she realized the intensity of what was happening to him. Thank you so much. Although Dorothy is still concerned, she is hopeful that this phase will soon pass. But several weeks later, Bobby's behavior becomes even more disturbing. Thank you, Robin, honey. Make sure the tops are on real tight, okay, love? You know, Bobby, it looks like I'm gonna need a few more of these jars to finish up this jam. Can you please head down to the cellar and grab a few and bring them up? Bobby, I am not going to ask you again. For weeks, Bobby has been terrified of the cellar. Mom, I really don't like it down there. Dorothy's patience is wearing thin. Bobby, this has got to stop. You're too old for this nonsense, and there's nothing down there. Go on. I opened up the door to the basement and looked down the stairs. I could sense this being being near me even when I couldn't see it. recognized the voice right away. I knew that it was the thing that was talking to me through the heater vent. Bobby decides it's time to stand up to his friend. I'm not afraid of you anymore. The day finally came when I finally got sick and tired of this thing being in my life. I don't want you in my life any longer. I always felt that it could easily do the same thing to my family that it was doing to me. Get out. Did you hear me? I said get out. After finally standing up to it, I felt fantastic. Bobby, sweetheart, what happened, honey? I heard glass breaking. Are you okay? Yes, Mom, I'm fine. Okay, all right, all right. You sure you're okay? Yes, Mom, he's gone. We're fine. This is the last time Bobby ever sees or hears from his friend in the basement. Okay, all right. Let's go upstairs, okay? It's exactly like being bullied. Finally, you have your day where you stand up to the bully and the bully backs down. I basically took the house back. From this point forward, Bobby lives a normal childhood. Got something? Yeah. yeah. All right, so show me what they've been teaching out there at Little League. I started playing Little League. I started getting involved in sports, doing better in school. Everything improved in my life. It was a total turnaround. It was a joy to see him back to himself. The point came where I put all this behind me, and I just let it go. I basically just blocked it all out, went on with my life, and that was it. All right, right in the glove. For the next 40 years, Bob never fully understands what happened to him all those years ago. He has gone on with his life to become a child safety specialist. You want to screw in any furniture more than 30 inches tall with wall restraints. I believe that all stems from my childhood. Everything I do in life is regarding the safety of children. Great. Connecticut Paranormal Investigators, this is Bob. How can I help you? While Bob works as a child safety specialist by day, by night, he investigates the paranormal. As I became older, I got involved more in the paranormal and started to realize that maybe what I experienced as a child really was true. And when did this start? Six years ago, Bob formed Connecticut Paranormal Investigators. I initially got involved in paranormal investigation mainly because of what happened to me. I wanted to help people. I knew I could help children out that were experiencing the same thing. Okay, great. I'll see you then. As an adult, Bob continues to visit his parents regularly. His mother and father still live in the same house in which he grew up, the same house where his nightmares began. Lately, 
He's been helping Dorothy take care of his father. Hi, Dad. How you doing today? For nearly 10 years, Francis has been suffering from Parkinson's disease and dementia. There we go. Initially, when a person suffers from dementia, you'll notice a stare. Let's get you downstairs. Francis's condition has recently taken a turn for the worse. My father was a staff sergeant in the Marines, so he was always that tough guy. And so he started to decline, and that was tough to watch. It was a slow decline. Dan? What's wrong? What is it? Are these figures purely an illusion? What is it? Or is the family home still really haunted? The truth will be revealed, and it's nothing anyone would have expected. Bob's ailing father complains about figures no one else can see. A sight so terrifying, it shakes him to the core. No, no. What, what is it? He would tell us that the person was sitting there and told us not to sit down. So that was quite disturbing. OK. OK, Dad, it's all right. Just we'll, we'll sit over here then. He was absolutely terrified of what he was seeing. You could see the fright in his face. He's terrified of everything lately. He, he won't even go near the cellar. Bob attributes his father's visions to his advanced condition. We discussed this with his doctor, and he said this happens a lot in patients that have dementia, where they'll start seeing things that aren't there. Inevitably, the disease takes its toll, and Francis passes away. After nearly a half a century of marriage, Dorothy lives alone for the first time. At first, I started hearing a discussion going on on a radio or on the TV, but it was at such a distance that you could barely make out that there was some kind of voice there. Dorothy wonders if her husband is trying to contact her from the afterlife. I miss you, Francis. My husband told me when he was sick that he would never leave. I always felt like the stuff I was experiencing in the house was attributable to my husband's spirit. But Dorothy's mind is about to change. I felt the strength from it, and the strength was very frightening. could feel the pressure in the mattress from someone actually sitting on the foot of the bed. And every time I looked, there was no one there. Dorothy soon realizes that the spiritual presence in her house is not her husband. It's something else, and it feels evil. The next morning, Dorothy calls her son Bob in tears. She is terrified of something in the house and asks him to come over and investigate. Oh, Bobby, Bobby, it's been hell around here. Something's happening. Bob had the ability to walk into a house and be able to tell whether there was a presence there. To put his mother's fears at ease, Bob agrees to investigate. I'll come visit more, and Robin will too. I basically did it to appease her. I was hoping that it would calm her down. She was probably a little bit scared to be living alone. Bobby, Bobby, you don't understand. Something was here last night. I felt it. It pushed me. OK, Mom, just, just calm down. I'm, I'm here to help. Bob attempts to collect evidence of the paranormal using a digital audio recorder. Is there anything here? Is there anything in this room with me? 
Can you make your presence known? Initially, when I was in the house, I didn't feel anything going on. It just felt benign. Tell me something. Is there anyone here? Can you make your presence known to me? I actually heard footsteps come across the floor towards me. I could feel it in my chest. I could feel it in my face. I felt weak in the legs. I actually felt nauseous. And I felt something, a presence in front of me. And at that very moment, I reverted back to my childhood. Bobby was be my friend. Sure. I felt all the terror that I felt when I was a child. Everything came right back to me. From his experience, Bob believes his mother is dealing with a dark entity. I think we should have this house blessed. You just to be on the safe side. I didn't want to relay my fears to my mother because she would probably be very afraid, and I didn't want to do that to her. And I'm going to bring in my team, too. Oh, yeah. Just, you know, as, as a follow-up. I had the impression that, that Bob was keeping some of the stuff away from me. I love you. Thanks for coming, Bobby. You'll be all right. Yes. Shortly after, Bob arrives with a team of investigators. Here I am after, you know, all these years back in the same place where I had problems and setting up for an investigation. It was just strange to me. Bob has worked with his colleague Joe Myers for many years. He's also asked Mary Curian to assist in the investigation. Like Bob, her childhood was plagued by the paranormal. I grew up in a haunted house myself. I was just terrified as a child. I didn't understand it. Nobody would really believe me. So that kind of gave me that basis to try to help people because you're not going crazy. Mary is a sensitive who possesses the ability to communicate with spirits. I'll go in and feel, and I can most likely tell you it's negative, it's not negative, there's nothing there, there's something there, run. Whatever it may be, I'm kind of like the radar. And they send me in first. I don't want to know anything about the case. I just don't want to be influenced by anyone's statements or anything, so I go in blind. We came out with everything that we had. We set up in the house trying to figure out where this thing was and what we needed to do to get rid of it. Within minutes of entering the house, Mary picks up on the spiritual activity. Bob. I'm sensing a man and a woman. Where? Here. I sensed a lot of spirits in the house. There was a man and woman in particular. Bob wonders if this is the man and woman that his father identified before he passed. Unfortunately, I missed that opportunity to help my father out when he was seeing these entities in the house. I wasn't there for him, and I really feel bad about that. Could these spirits be the bodies buried under the house? kind of hurt knowing that all this was right in front of my nose all the time, and I was choosing to ignore it instead of dealing with it. Is this your bedroom? Yeah. When I went into Bob's old bedroom, there was like this heaviness in the air. It was hard to breathe. Mary immediately picks up on an evil presence. What's wrong? The strongest feeling I got is this one dark entity was kind of keeping him there. They were kind of being held captive. We need to investigate the cellar. Bob leads Mary down into the cellar, hoping to battle the dark entity once more. The further I went down into it, you could feel the oppression. It was growing thicker and thicker. Feels really heavy down here. Feels as though something really bad happened. Without any prior knowledge of the house's history, Mary senses a tragedy that occurred on the property. 
I feel as though the spirits are not really attached to the house, but the land. I really feel something tragic happened on the land. They kind of drew this negative energy kind of in. I had a vision of a body being carried and dumped on the property there. Why were these bodies buried under the house? They may never know the answer. But when the dark entity appears before her, Mary knows this is just the beginning. For more A Haunting, go to DestinationAmerica.com. After Mary receives a sign from the dark entity, she realizes that they're dealing with a force of pure evil. It absolutely wants to get your attention by the physical manifestations it's doing. Bob, there's a, a negative entity in here with us. The thing that stood out the most was the blackness of it and the hood and the feelings associated with it. You saw it? Where? It was right over there. It was standing in the corner. Bob can finally confirm what he suspected as a child. That's, that's what I used to see. This is the exact description of the entity he saw in the basement many years ago. I never described to Mary before what this being looked like, so to have somebody finally, after all these years, see exactly what I saw as a child was such a relief to me. The team sticks it out through the night, hoping to capture video evidence of what is haunting Dorothy. While Dorothy sleeps, the team analyzes the photos Bob took during the investigation. Dining room, here's my room. Anything there? No. You sure? Anything there? Nah. You see wait, 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 go there? back, go back. What? What's that? Joe identifies an orb, which is often considered evidence of spiritual manifestation. Most of the time, orbs are nothing more than water vapor or dust. So it's uh, something you have to be very careful with. But when he looks closer, Bob makes a disturbing discovery. A face is revealed on one of the orbs captured in a photo. This face was the same demon that I saw in the house as a child. I didn't even know what to think at that point. Just knowing now that I have proof in a picture was such a relief to me. But certainly not a relief to his mother. I woke up to being pushed on my bed as though someone had both their hands on my back. I was absolutely terrified. Bobby! Bob is now certain that the demon haunting Dorothy is the same one that tormented him as a child. I realized I'm living in this house with something that could hurt me. I didn't want to be there anymore. I just wanted out. I was absolutely concerned for my mother's safety. I was at the point where I just felt something was going to happen at any second that was bad. So I decided to move her out of the house, and she moved in with me. Get me out of here, Bobby. Hi. Bob and the team believe solving the demonic problem is beyond their capability as investigators they decide to bring in Bishop Robert McKenna. Bishop McKenna is a priest and a world-renowned exorcist. And knowing that we had him on our team 
was a great benefit to us, and we knew we had a fighting chance with him being there. I'd like to start the blessing here in the living room. When the bishop arrives, he goes right to work. He doesn't waste any time. Bishop McKenna begins with the exorcism prayer and blesses each room in the house. When Bishop McKenna entered, I felt a lot more spirit activity going on in the house. You could tell there was an agitation. A blessed Michael, the archangel, of the blessed apostles, Peter and Paul, and all the saints, and powerful in the holy authority of our ministry, we confidently undertake to repulse the attacks and deceits of the devil. Bishop McKenna is drawn to the cellar. Maybe he has his own sixth sense about it. He could feel out where it was. We need to go down there. Suddenly, Mary receives a spiritual warning. No, Bishop, wait! The voice I heard was definitely a mocking warning, and I felt it was from that dark, tall figure. What's behind this door? The cellar. We need to go down there. We drive you from us, whoever you may be. The stairs. No, Bishop, wait! After the demon attacks Bishop, the bishop, okay? the team realizes this entity is out to kill. The demon's capable of pushing a bishop down the stairs. It's capable of doing anything. The demon's here. I can feel him. He was the big gun. He was our ace in the hole. And now he was just subdued. God the Father commands you. God the Son commands you. God the Holy Ghost commands you. Christ, God's word made... The more noise that you hear, the more you know you're disturbing it. And that's exactly what you want to do. You're looking to get under its skin as much as possible because you're looking to rid it from the house. We were determined not to stop no matter what this thing did. It was trying to do things to scare us, but it wasn't working. Everybody stood their ground. Let us pray together. But then the demon suddenly makes Mary its next victim. So Should we stop? Says, no. We need to see it through to the end. <laughs> We resolved to stay and finish because now, if you had angered it, it was going to be worse. Worse for Dorothy, worse for Bob, worse for anyone that went into that house. So it had to be taken to the very limit. We couldn't give up. As the bishop continues in Latin, the demon grows angry. It refuses to leave without a fight. I felt the strength of that dark entity. I didn't feel it weakening. I felt myself weakening, and all that I could think of is, I don't think this is going to work. I really don't think this is going to work. As far as I was concerned, at the end of the exorcism, we thought we had a success. We thought for sure we had gotten rid of it. That night, Bob thinks he can rest, knowing that the demon is gone. But is it? The nightmare that haunted Bob as a child returns. Once I started having the dreams again, I knew we probably weren't successful. Over the next several months, Bob and his team worked tirelessly to fight the demon. We decided to try a number of different types of blessings in the home. We tried everything that you can imagine, and nothing seemed to work. Bishop McKenna realizes that prayer alone has failed, and he returns for a second assault against the demon. Using holy incense, 
the bishop hopes to purify the house by filling every inch of it with smoke. Holy incense is used with the belief that it will affect the demon. It will force it out of wherever it is. Persistence was our objective in trying to get rid of this thing. I think anything that we could have put our hands on, we would have done at that point. Well, I can't thank you enough. You're most welcome. May God be with you. I hope it worked. No offense, Bob. Your mom's got a beautiful home, but I hope to never step foot in it again. This is one of the strongest forces that I've ever had to deal with in all my years of doing this. We left there feeling pretty positive. It was gonna be a good thing, a good outcome. A week later, the smoke completely clears. Bob and Joe return to the house to hopefully close the case. We wanted to make sure that the demon was gone. They compare notes before they investigate. We had been in there for quite some time talking and discussing things, and we actually heard footsteps in the living room, the floor cracking again. What's that? For Bob and Joe, it becomes quickly obvious that their investigation is not ready to be closed. The spiritual attack robs both men of their ability to breathe and delivers heart attack-like chest pains. It felt like an elephant sitting on your chest. You couldn't not breathe at all. We ran for our lives. It was that bad. For Bob, the near-death experience is enough to call it quits. You all right? We can't do this anymore. That thing is stronger than us. I think you're right. I'm a fighter. I want to keep going back at it and uh, keep doing what I do. But uh, I finally realized it's just too strong. This thing is so strong that it could probably actually kill us. Bob knows that he can no longer fight this demon. He vows to never return to the house again. I'm very proud of him because he took on a big fight, a big battle. Here you go, sweetie. He kept fighting and fighting and fighting. And I think within himself, he continues to fight. I'm sorry I let you down, Mom. Oh, I know you did your best, Bob. But sometimes you just you just have to walk away. I know. The hardest part of this experience for me was having to walk away from my mother's house, knowing that I hadn't helped her, and uh, knowing that I had to give in, and uh, I feel defeated by that. Neither Bob nor Dorothy has ever set foot in the house again. No one has. When you investigate your own home, it's very difficult to remain objective. Uh, you can't have an open mind because you're so close to the action. You're actually being affected by what's going on, so you can't make proper uh, determination as far as uh, what should be done and what's the right thing to do. I should have stepped back, let somebody totally handle it, because you become emotionally attached to everything, and um, you know it's just it's it's hard to make the right decisions when you're doing that. You're you're going to make mistakes. Today, the house remains empty, still in the same condition 
as it was left. To me, it's heartbreaking because my grandfather owned this land. He allowed my parents to build a home on it. We uh, grew up on this property. My mother still wants to live there somehow, but I know there's no going back. What I would say to a skeptic is go into that house. You never know what could present itself. But more so, I would say to the skeptic, look at this woman. She's leaving her whole life behind. All her memories, her marriage, her children, their childhood. This house was built for them. And leave its contents there. Something had to terrify her enough to get her to leave. Unfounded fear? I don't think so. Walk in her shoes. Thank <laughs> you.